Well, we begin this morning with singing, and uh, all the screens this morning are on the screens, uh, and uh, you shouldn't need your hymn books. But we're going to be singing the first hymn as with gladness, men of old did the guiding star behold. As we sit, let's join our hearts together in prayer. Let's pray. As with gladness, those who first welcomed your coming into this world rejoiced, so we rejoice today as we come before you, our Lord and our God, our great Savior, to acknowledge your splendor, your throne of majesty which is also a throne of grace and mercy, of great salvation. And we rejoice, Lord, in the wonders of this season and the many reminders of your nearness to us, so near to our human lives, our human frames, because you took our flesh, you came into our world to save us. And so that means that you know, you know from the inside all about us, all our joys and all our sorrows, all the things that fill our human hearts, all the things that concern our lives upon this earth. Nothing 
at all about our hearts or our experiences or our loves or our excitements or our fears, our worries, our longings, even our tears, nothing that you don't know and understand or feel and feel with us. Now we thank you, our God and Father, for Christ Jesus, your Son, for our great Savior, who is a sharer in our flesh, our great friend, a brother, a sustainer. And so we pray, Lord, this morning as we gather in his name that you would make us a people worthy of him, that he also should be glad in us, glad to call us brothers and sisters, that we should bring him joy and pleasure, even as he has brought us such joy and the light of life eternal. Fill us, Lord, we pray, with his joy, the joy in him, and joy in sharing his wonderful message of joy to this world. May we be a people who in our lives repeat the sounding joy far as the curse is found, that many might see his light even in us and hear of his glory from our lips and join with us in praising his name our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, in his name, this morning, we bring our prayers, longing for your presence, glad in your promise, blessed with your nearness. And we thank you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Well, a very warm welcome indeed to uh, all of you uh, this morning, especially if you're visiting with us and if it's your first time here, uh, you are very welcome indeed in the name of the Lord Jesus and of uh, our church, his fellowship here. Maybe that some of you are visiting back after being away for a long time and uh, you're equally welcome and it's good to see some old faces uh, this morning. We uh, don't have an evening service uh, tonight. We've been here so much this last week with Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. We're going to enjoy a Sabbath rest this evening. But next Sunday, we're back to uh, normal, and we meet at 11 a.m. and 6.30. I shall be away next Sunday, but uh, Edward Lobb is preaching in the morning and Bob File in the evening, and uh, we're back to normal. We don't have the uh, normal senior Sunday school and Bible class this morning, but there is a creche, and there is Sunday school for those under eight. And uh, during the second hymn, after the next reading, uh, our little ones will be able to go out to be looked after. Uh, we don't have uh, any midweek meetings this coming week either, but uh, there is an important meeting on Tuesday at the University Chapel at uh, midday when uh, our young friends Katie Dancer and Dave Gilmore will be getting married, and uh, they'd be very glad to see any of you there uh, to rejoice with them in that service, and I'm sure you'll have them in your prayers. Well, we're going to uh, read together in uh, the Scriptures, in Luke's Gospel at chapter 1, and uh, that's on page 855, if you have one of our church visitors' Bibles. We're going to be looking this morning particularly at uh, what Elizabeth has to say at the end of, uh, well, verses 39 to 45, but we're going to read in a little bit to get the background of the story, starting at Luke's Gospel, chapter 1 and verse 5. And Luke tells us, in the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah. And he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. But they had no child, because Elizabeth was barren, and both were advanced in years. Now, while he was serving as priest before God, when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside the, at the hour of incense. 
And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. And your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John, and you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord. He must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. And Zechariah said to the angel, How shall I know this? For I am an old man and my wife is advanced in years. The angel answered him, I am Gabriel who stands in the presence of God. And I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And behold, you'll be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. And the people were waiting for Zechariah, and they were wondering at his delay in the temple. And when he came out, he was unable to speak to them. They realized that he had seen a vision in the temple. And he kept making signs to them and remained mute. When his time of service was ended, he went to his home. After these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived. And for five months she kept herself hidden, saying, Thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked upon me to take away my reproach among people. Amen. May God bless to us his word. Oh, we sing another lovely carol now. The story has broken, the angel has spoken, and this is the token that Jesus is here. let's take our Bibles again and uh, turn back to continue that story in Luke chapter 1 at uh, verse 26 we're then told of the same angel Gabriel appearing to Mary and with a similar message about 
a conception and an extraordinary birth, this time even more extraordinary. And uh, this time, what a difference. Not disbelief, but Mary believes. She says, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. And in verse 39, we're told, In those days Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah. And she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed, believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. Amen. May God bless to us his word. And we sing again another wonderful hymn that speaks of how God laid his glory by and took form in mortal clay, unseen by human eye, the hidden Godhead lay. Infant of days he here became and bore the meek Emmanuel's name. Let earth and heaven combine.
as the musicians play quietly, our offerings for the Lord's work will be received. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we are glad that we come before your throne, the throne from which this world is controlled and ruled, unseen by human eye, but to the eye of faith and trust, known and clear and sure. Though there are many mysteries, O oh God, in our lives and in this world, one thing we do know, and that is that you, the creator and sustainer of all things, that you are powerful, that you are in control, that all things now and in the future are in your hands. And what confidence that gives us as we come before you with our prayers and petitions what a sense of peace and of contentment to know that everything that we bring into your presence and into your hands is safe and everything that we ask of you will be heard and will be answered in your perfect plan and purpose that far outweighs even our greatest understanding. And so, Lord, we come before you this morning with many perplexities, many questions in our hearts, many sadnesses weighing down upon our spirits. We've been made so conscious in these recent days of the fragility of human life. We pray, Lord, very particularly for the many in our own city here for whom this Christmas has been darkened beyond belief because of the tragedy that took place in George Square just the other day and people going about their business, going to spend time and enjoyment with family and with loved ones who were so cruelly interrupted by that awful tragedy. Lord, we pray for those affected personally and for whom this Christmas will be unbearably sad, and for whom every Christmas hence will be 
a painful reminder of something so awful that it can never, ever be left behind. Lord, you are the Father who knows deeply in your heart what it is to experience the pain and the loss of your own Son. Now we thank you that you are a God of all comfort and grace who can bring peace even to the wounded heart and bring hope even to hearts and lives riven by sorrow and sadness. We pray, dear Lord, for the light of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ to shine brightly in these days in our own city here and indeed in every place where there is darkness and sadness. We think today of yet another headline of an airliner having gone missing in Southeast Asia, so close to the tragedies that have beset the airline industry already this year, both from Malaysia. We pray for all of those families gathering in the airports in Indonesia and in Singapore today, waiting for news and fearing the worst. Lord, as we are reminded of the fragility of our human lives, we are reminded that but for you, we are, each one of us, but a breath away from eternity, that everything in this world depends upon your sustaining grace and mercy, for which we thank you and praise you, that this day we have breath in our bodies, that we are able to join together and praise your name is a gift of your sovereign power and of your sovereign mercy. For what is in our hearts, Lord, should rightfully have caused you to shut yourself off us, away from us forever. But such is your grace in Jesus Christ, your Son, that you have promised to sustain this whole world that the message of your goodness and the wonders of your love might be proclaimed to the very ends of this earth, to every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And so, Lord, we pray very particularly this morning for our mission partners in other parts of the world with whom we share this great and joyful task of proclaiming our Savior. We remember Imran and Nagina Gill and their family working in Pakistan with all the dangers that country brings to those who name the name of Christ. We think of that terrible tragedy in Peshawar, the school shooting just the other day, and we thank you that Imran and some of his team have been making contact with the families of those who lost children and loved ones. We pray for grace and mercy to shine from their faces, to be seen and heard and understood and reached out to. We think of Sam and Ruth Lee, Lord, and their love and passion for the people with whom they work in Southeast Asia, and we pray for them as they're on home assignment in the Netherlands and ask that this would be a time of great refreshment and encouragement, that you would prepare them for going back to their work with all that they need, May they be encouraged, and may they encourage others greatly as they speak of their work in different places in that land and in our own land. We think of Scott and Nock Murray, Lord, working away in the River Kwai Christian Hospital in Thailand, and thank you for all the opportunities that they have to share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Be with them, Lord, we pray, as they have time as family and Grant them your strength and your help for all that lies ahead before their time of coming back on home assignment in the summer. We pray that you would provide for their needs and that above all that there would be cover provided for the hospital so that Scott might leave knowing that things are in capable hands. We think of Roy Murray, Lord, and rejoice that he has been here with us these months on home assignment and pray for him that you would continue to strengthen him bodily and be preparing him in every way for the new assignment you have for him as in the coming months 
His mind will turn and soon his body will return also to South America for all the new work that you have for him there. We pray for the Robery family in Jos, Nigeria, another place, O oh Lord, where people are so conscious that their life depends daily upon you. We think of those two bombs that exploded in the market just weeks ago, and we ask for our dear family there for protection, for health, for strength, that all the Bible translation work that David is involved in would come to fruition that many there might have the Word of God in their own language, that they might praise you and proclaim you to others in the language of the people's hearts. We pray also, Lord, for Jonathan and Dewey Blythe in Turkey, thanking you for the involvement that they have had with churches there over so many years and for the way they have seen churches grow and expand and plant and multiply. How we thank you, Lord, for all that you have done through their life and witness and that of many others in that land. We bring these, our beloved partners, to you, Lord, and ask that along with us in this coming year of 2015, you would bring great blessing that as you took the loaves and the fishes offered by a little boy in faith and in trust to the Savior, so you would take all that they and we are able to do and to offer to you in our lives and in our work, whatever that work might be day by day in this coming year, that you would take us, Lord, and use us far more greatly than we could ever imagine, not because of any worth in us, but because of your joy in planting your seed within us and using even that which is weak and frail, and that which is made only of dust, but in your hands to become weapons of righteousness and instruments of grace and mercy and truth within this dark world. Forgive us, Lord, our sins, which are many and manifold. Help us, we pray, in this coming year to set behind us the many things that so entangle us and prevent us from living fully to your glory. Help us to help one another as we encourage one another and teach one another to live so as to follow our Lord Jesus Christ more nearly day by day and week by week. And may we come to the end of this coming year and look back with joy and gladness and thanksgiving in all that you have done showing that you are a God who created the world out of nothing and out of what so often is nothing of worth in our lives are able to create something beautiful and lovely and fruitful in your service. So, Lord, take us, we pray, as a people. Bind us together in the unity of your Holy Spirit. Lead us by the light of your word in this coming year. And grant us, we pray, to bring glory to our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Well, before we come to God's word, we sing once more the lovely carol, Infant Holy, (coughs) Infant Lowly.
Well, would you turn with me to Luke chapter 1, page 856, and we're going to look particularly at these verses about Mary visiting Elizabeth, verses 39 to 45. A song of joy for the first, the very first hearers of the good news about the birth, the coming birth of Jesus. Verse 41 of Luke's Gospel, chapter 1, says, Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she exclaimed with a loud cry. She burst into song. We've been seeing just how Christmas has rung with uh, the sound of song right from the very beginning, because, as George Campbell Morgan put it, when Jesus came into the world, poetry expressed itself, and music was reborn. Heaven's arches rang, and the angels sang, proclaiming the royal decree, as the carol says. And uh, even though the Savior's birth was uh, largely unnoticed by men, there were some on earth who joined the joy of heaven and who rejoiced in great song. And they sang for joy. And we've been looking at some of these songs that, uh, that Luke records in the first two chapters of his gospel. Songs, many songs, for the Savior's birth. And uh, it's right, indeed it's necessary, to sing and to make music in our hearts to God when He is at work doing wonderful things in the world. And that's always been the case. Whenever God's Spirit has been at work in marvelous ways in this world, in reviving power, there's been an outbreak of song, of praise to God. There's been a writing of songs and a singing of songs. Just think of the uh, the Great Awakening in the 18th century and all the hymns that followed that, Isaac Watts, Charles Wesley, and the like. Now, it's that way around, of course. We mustn't be confused about that. Sometimes people today get rather confused and they think that um, what we can do is we can induce a great reviving work of God, a great renewing work of God by singing. And so uh, there's a tendency to have ever longer and endless times of worship, so-called worship, which means singing to most people, to create a spiritual experience. But that's the wrong way around. It's the other way around. That's back to front. It is actually when God is at work first in His mighty, reviving power, when His gospel is being heard, when His gospel is being received and responded to and understood, then people respond with joy, and they break forth in songs of joy. And that's exactly what we've been seeing in these first two chapters of Luke's Gospel. And that's what we see in this passage today, in what is actually, I think, the very first song uh, of Christmas, in what Elizabeth speaks here. Her song doesn't get a fancy Latin name like the other ones, you know, the Benedictus and the Magnificat and the Nunc Dimittis and all these other Latin names. But Elizabeth's song actually is the first Benedictus. Because uh, while her husband, Zechariah, who gets credited with the Benedictus, while he's still dumb and can't speak, Elizabeth is singing Benedictus, verse 30, uh, 42, blessed are you. Now, poor old Zechariah at this stage is still on sign language. The only thing he could offer would be the actions to a song, but he couldn't sing. But uh, Elizabeth doesn't get any posh Latin name, but her song I'm going to call the joy of of the first heroes. In fact, it's a song of this heavenly pregnant woman, Elizabeth, who is going to be the mother of John. And it really is a song of joy, of great joy. In fact, if we're going to be very honest, we'd have to say it's more of a song and dance routine, because it's Elizabeth and her unborn child, John, who are both involved. And it's John, verse 41, who quite literally kicks things off in the womb. He's leaping for joy within his mother's womb. So let's start there with John as he responds to the arrival of Mary to visit his mother, carrying, as Mary is, the incarnate Lord of glory as a tiny, tiny embryo in her womb. Look at verse 40. It says that uh, Mary entered the house and greeted Elizabeth, and as soon as the words were out of her mouth, we get an extraordinary, miraculous expression of joy. 
And the first thing that Luke tells us about the joy of this great occasion is about joy in the womb. Verse 41, the baby leaped in her womb. And then in Elizabeth's own words in verse 44, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. So the first joy that Luke is pointing us to is joy expressed by John. The intrauterine joy of a spirit-filled unborn child. That's the clear implication of verse 41 when we're told that John leaped for joy. The implication is that he is filled with the Spirit, just as his mother, too, we're told, was filled with the Holy Spirit. And that's uh, simply fulfilling what the angel had actually explicitly told Zechariah earlier on, as we read in verse 15. Do you see? He will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb, straight up. So here is the very first hearer of the gospel in the Bible, the very first believer leaping for joy is in the womb. And he dances for joy at the presence of the Savior. And the Savior, too, is just a tiny embryo in the womb. I wonder if you find that hard to believe. Well, that is plainly what the text in front of us is saying, isn't it? Let me reassure you, remember who the writer is here. It is Luke, the physician. He's a doctor. He's not completely out of his field, therefore, writing about intrauterine matters. He's no fool. Luke is a man of facts, a careful researcher. He's already said that. He's not somebody who's, who's swayed by sort of mumbo-jumbo and wild stories. He's a man who's swayed by evidence and facts. We can trust Luke's judgment not to be somebody of wild speculation. He's a careful, evidence-seeking, sober assessor of all things, and presumably especially all things medical. He's a meticulous physician, and he's done his research. And surely I think we can trust him. Look back, by the way, just to verses 1 to 4. It just reminds us that Luke stakes his entire reputation on what he's writing. He's researched verse 2 all the way back to the beginning. Verse 3, he's considered all things. He's done so closely and carefully. And so he tells us he's written an orderly account so that we can be certain. And he is absolutely clear in what he writes here. John, a five-month-old fetus, we're into the sixth month just, in the womb, at the moment Mary arrived bearing her baby, Jesus, and John leaps for joy. He rejoices in the presence of the Messiah. Let me quote to you from uh, Howard Marshall, who was one of my uh, professors uh, in uh, divinity. It's surely one of the soberest scholars you could possibly find uh, of the New Testament. He says this, a miraculous expression of the emotion of the unborn child is meant. Not that Elizabeth simply saw her own joy reflected in the unconscious movement of her child. But just like his mother, John is filled with the Holy Spirit. This is joy in the womb, the joy of the very first believer. And indeed, more than that, he is the very first evangelist. What did the angel said? That John will be filled with the Holy Spirit from the womb, verse 16, and he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. Well, here it is. John's spirit-filled leaping is what turns his mother to recognize the coming of the Lord. That's what Elizabeth says in verse 44, absolutely plain. She recognizes that Mary is bearing her Lord for, verse 44, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leapt for joy. That's how she knew. Howard Marshall again. 
she knew that Mary was to be the mother of the Messiah by the joyous movements of her child in response to Mary's greeting. By this intrauterine evangelistic dance of John the Baptist. Now, what, what are we to make of all of this? Well, surely it's quite simply this, that everyone in this entire story is caught up with something totally miraculous. This is God's story. And when God is at work in the world, amazing things can happen, and amazing things do happen. See, what Luke is telling us here, and indeed all through his gospel, but especially here in these opening chapters, is that God is a God who keeps his promises. And he does so in the most extraordinary of ways. So verse 37, that's what the angel says to Mary, nothing will be impossible with God. God makes promises, and we are to believe them and to trust his word. His promises will be fulfilled in their time. That was the angel's rebuke to Zechariah back in verse 20, wasn't it? They will be fulfilled, and you don't believe it. God always keeps his word, and he can do it in the most wonderful and extraordinary of ways, even filling an unborn child with his Holy Spirit and making him dance for joy. By the way, we shouldn't lose the significance of that either, should we? of this encounter between Jesus and John, when both of them are still in the womb. John was something less than a 24-week-old fetus at this time, into the sixth month of pregnancy. And Jesus, well, could have been no more than just a tiny embryo, what the scientists today would just dismiss as just a ball of cells. And yet his presence as just a ball of cells His presence is the presence of God incarnate on earth. Isn't that an extraordinary thing? And John responded with joy to his presence. That's something we need to remember, isn't it, when we talk about stem cells, when we talk about abortion, when we talk about all of these things that are so easily dismissed as being of no consequence to human life today. And another thing, John began to fulfill his destiny before his birth and from his birth. That's what the angel had said. And you see, in God's story, wonderful things like that can happen. It's not unique either, is it, in the Bible? There are others who are set apart in the womb and from their birth. That should make us think about our children too, shouldn't it? But our prayers for them. And God's hold upon them from infancy, even before infancy. Of course, in one sense, John is unique. But in another sense, the Bible tells us very clearly he's not unique at all. Elizabeth and uh, and all the others in this story are set forth as examples of true faith. They are set forth by Luke as examples for us to emulate. We're told back in verse 6 of chapter 1 that they're they're righteous before God. They're walking blamelessly. These are godly people, people of real faith. And Jesus himself tells us that even the least in his kingdom are greater than John the Baptist. So in just the same way, we can know, can't we, that God has his plan and his purpose for us and even for our children, even in the womb, even before they're born. That means that we too can lay hold of God's covenant promises by faith, just as they did. We can take God at His Word, and we can lead our own children into the destiny that God has for them. And John's parents are an example of that for us, and Luke means us to see that. Zechariah had to be rebuked, of course, but he took his rebuke, and then he did at last, didn't he? He laid hold upon the destiny of his son by naming him John, as God had said. By doing that, he was grasping hold of God's promises for his child. Well, that brings us to the second thing 
We've had joy in the womb experienced by John, and now we're clearly told about joy in the woman, and that's something that's expressed by Elizabeth. Elizabeth, verse 42, burst into song. She, she exclaimed with a loud cry. And it's a response to the leaping of John in her womb, which in turn is a response to the sound of Mary's greeting. You read about people today, don't you, playing music and singing uh, and reading to unborn children in the womb. This is, this is clearly something quite beyond that. Mary's greeting surely can hardly be more than just a few words. She came into the house. Maybe she blurted out, Elizabeth, I'm having a baby. The, the, an angel told me. I don't know what she said. Maybe Zechariah, in all these uh, months of silence, had, had managed to write down and get across to his wife Elizabeth all that the angel had told him. Maybe Elizabeth had, had put it all together and had understood that. But surely John, a little baby still in the womb, couldn't have put it all together and understood it. It's much simpler, isn't it, to just realize that something miraculous, something wonderful is happening here, and overtaking everybody in this story. They don't understand it all fully. I don't believe that for a minute. But the presence of the Lord in the midst simply changed everything for them. And somehow Elizabeth understands that, that, that the mother of her Lord has come to her. And even John in the womb responds to the Lord that he himself has been born to serve and to make way for. And actually, when you think about it, it often is like that, even in our own experience. Maybe that's true of some of you here this morning. Maybe you've come to church seeking something. You haven't quite known what. Perhaps you've been through one of our Christianity Explored courses. Maybe you've just been coming along on a Sunday morning, and you, you don't quite understand it all. You couldn't put it all together and just uh, tell anybody exactly what it is that's happened. You can't understand or articulate it all yet. But you know that something extraordinary has happened to you, something miraculous has happened to you. You just know that the Lord has come into your life. And that leads to expressions of joy. That's so often the way it is in people's lives. We don't understand everything that's happened, but we know that something real has come into our life. And that's what Luke is showing us here in the joy expressed by these women. But notice the focus of their joy. Here's two women, both newly pregnant. They've got so much in common there. Both of them extraordinary pregnancies. So much excitement and all of that. You would have thought, wouldn't you, that their song would have been all about that. But it's not about that. Of course, Elizabeth does recognize God's goodness to her and and so on, back in verses 24 and 25, we read that. She gives thanks to God for everything that he's, he's done. But here, when Mary comes, her joy is in a different dimension altogether. It's not just joy in her child, it's joy in another child, verse 43. It's joy in her Lord who has come to her, in Mary's womb. And she shares the joy of her own unborn son in the presence of Mary's son the one whom she calls her own Lord. Now, whether Zechariah had understood it all in his silent hours of pondering, whether he'd, he'd told Elizabeth, we just don't know. But clearly, Elizabeth here grasped what Mary's conception meant. Verse 43, her Lord has come to her. What she means is the Messiah King has come to me. In Psalm 110, David speaks of the Messiah, as his Lord. Jesus himself applies that explicitly to himself later on in Luke's gospel. David says, Yahweh, Jehovah, says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make all your enemies your footstool. He's speaking unequivocally about the Son of God, the great King who is to come. And Elizabeth's expressing her joy in precisely those biblical terms. And it shows that she understands. She understands that she's caught up in something vast, something eternal. She is caught up in God's ultimate plan for the whole world. That's what she's saying. 
And that's why her personal joy and her own domestic blessing of having a son in her old age, that's why it's overtaken by a much greater joy of what God is doing in his story. Her joy is in her privileged place in that story. That's always what marks out people of faith, isn't it? There are people who are her, whose horizons are filled with not just their own personal circumstances, not just how, how God fits into my life to bless me, however much he does, and of course he does. But with people of real faith, it's always the other way around, isn't it? They're taken up with God's story and what God is doing and how that is unfolding in the world. That's what it means to be righteous before God. That's what it means to be walking blamelessly before him, as verse 6 describes these people. It's the same as in chapter 2, verse 25, when we're told about Simeon, who was devout and righteous, waiting for the consolation of Israel. In other words, these are people who are taken up with God's plan and purposes of salvation. These are gospel people, people who are looking for God's great intervention in the world. And there's a hint of that, I think, back in verse 13, where, where the angel says to Zechariah, your prayer has been heard, and your wife will bear a son. At first, when you read that verse, it looks rather like what Zechariah has been praying for the whole time is a son for his wife Elizabeth. But that can't be so, can it? Because in verse 18, it's very clear that that possibility wasn't even on Zechariah's radar screen. He didn't believe the angel when he said that. Now, Zechariah was there as the priest of Israel, chosen as the one person to offer prayers to God on behalf of the whole nation of Israel. And his prayer was prayer for God's salvation to come to his people. His prayer was a longing for the redemption of Jerusalem, for the comfort of his people, a longing for God to answer his plan of salvation. And that's the prayer that the angel says is answered. Because God always answers prayers for his gospel to be fulfilled. And Elizabeth's joy, her great joy, you see, is not just that God has answered prayers for her own domestic situation, that God has come into her story, as it were. Now, Elizabeth's joy is focused on the fact that she has somehow been taken up into God's marvelous story, into his saving story for the whole world. That's what explains her joy. I'm not minimizing Elizabeth's joy at her own child. Of course she has joy in that. She thanks God for that. She rejoices in verse 25 that God has removed her reproach. Childlessness in those days was a great reproach. Of course, it's still a great sadness today, isn't it, to many? It's very real and very painful. But it was far, far worse then because it wasn't just the normal natural pain of not having a child. It was a reproach. It brought stigma. It meant that you had no future, no destiny, no continuance of a family name. But you see, Elizabeth was a woman of true faith, and she knew that real joy, she knew that that lasting joy wasn't to be found just in a seed of her own, however natural her desire for a child would be. She knew that her hope was in the seed, in the promised seed. She knew that her real joy was in the Savior, in the Christ whom God had promised. And that is what we see her joy to be in here. Her Lord has come to her. And that's what opens her heart in such joy. You see, friends, it's, it's not really so very different today. There are all sorts of things that, that we long for in our own personal lives, aren't there? Sometimes it might be natural yearnings, just exactly like Elizabeth's, yearning for a baby. Or yearning for a wife to have a home and family with, or a husband or yearning for health itself, or, or all sorts of other things in life that are natural desires that we have, and things which do bring great joy, great satisfaction in life. But friends, true joy, although 
it is reflected in all of these things. True joy, lasting joy, solid joy and lasting treasures. That's found only in the Lord himself coming to us. Just as Jesus in the womb came to Elizabeth. And you see, she knew that and understood that even then. And that is why she felt such joy and expressed it. But how? How is that joy that she had really found? Well, that's the third thing that Luke wants us to see here. It's joy in the Word. There's joy, yes, experienced by John in the womb. There's joy expressed in song by the women, by Elizabeth, and also by Mary. But the joy that they have is explained by the Word, by the message about the Messiah who is coming. That's the road to joy for both of these women. It was belief and trust in the promise of God coming to fulfillment at last. Verse 45, Elizabeth says, Mary believed. She believed that God's word would be fulfilled. Quite a contrast, wasn't it, to Elizabeth's own husband? He didn't believe the word that the angel said, didn't believe that it would be fulfilled in its time. And that led him to misery, to dumbness. But Mary believed, and it led to great blessing and to great joy. And I guess verse 45 could equally apply to Elizabeth, couldn't it? Because she also believed, and she also welcomed the message of Mary with joy. And so what Luke is telling us is the way to this joy from God is to have faith in God. It's belief and trust that God's Word is true. It's belief and trust that all His promises will be fulfilled. That God keeps His promises of salvation. And Mary and Elizabeth both trusted him, and they found in doing that great joy, real personal joy. And in doing so, they discovered also that they were, they were caught up in something wonderfully personal as well as something vast and cosmic and eternal. They had real personal, unspeakable joy. But the way to that joy was joy first of all in the Word, in the Word of God's promise. And Mary exemplifies one side of that real faith and trust that Luke wants us to understand. When Mary heard the Word from the angel, verse 38, she believed, she said, let it be to me according to your Word. I am the servant of the Lord. In other words, she submitted to God's truth. She bowed her knee to God. And that's faith, according to the Bible. Glad obedience to God's Word. Elizabeth, though, exhibits another side of the very same thing, because she heard and believed with joy. In other words, she rejoiced in God's truth. And that also is real faith. And that's how the Bible describes faith to us. It's a submission to God that rejoices. And it's a rejoicing that submits to God. And it was deeply personal for these women. They rejoiced in the gospel message. They believed in the promise of God. And because they did, they were both caught up in something far, far greater for the rest of their lives. They were lifted right up and beyond and out of their own little world of ordinary people living ordinary, quiet lives. Their own personal stories, ordinary as they were, they became woven into God's story. The story which is the story of all eternity. And they became part of that wonderful story which will never, ever end. Just plain, ordinary people, people like you and me. But people were changed and transformed by that to have a destiny that goes on forever. All because they rejoiced in the promise of God, because they rejoiced and received the good news of Jesus Christ. They had joy in the Word, joy in the joyful message of Jesus. And friends, 2,000 years have passed, but nothing has changed. 
because that can still happen to ordinary people, people like you and me, people like Elizabeth and Mary and Zechariah and all the rest. And that's why Luke wrote this down in his gospel. That's why it's been preserved for us. Because it's not just joy in the womb for John. It's not just joy for these women, Elizabeth and Mary, through their belief and trust in God's promises, their joy in God's Word. No, this is for us also. This is for all the world. This is joy for the world. And it's just as wonderful today for us and for all the people of this world, although we're separated by by 2,000 years of time. If you're a Christian believer, then Elizabeth's experience is yours also, just the same, just as good. In fact, it's better. Because, as Paul says to the Ephesians, when you believed, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit to the praise of God's glory. And you also can sing with the joy of the Spirit like Elizabeth. And you have everything that she had, but you have it even better because what she believed that God would fulfill all His promises has indeed been fulfilled as God raised the Lord Jesus Christ from the dead. There has been a fulfillment of everything God promised. And therefore, that means that everything that God promised to them is ours today, and indeed for all eternity. There's joy to the world. And that's the message of Christmas, that it's for us as well. That's why we sing, good Christian men rejoice with heart and soul and voice. Because the joy of Christmas is for every believer. That's why Jesus says, even the least in the kingdom is greater than John the Baptist. Because God kept his promises. And he still does. He fulfills everything that is spoken But what about if you're not yet a Christian? What about if you're not a believer in God's promise? What about you? Well, if it's joy to the world, then it must be joy offered to you as well, mustn't it? If you will hear the message, if you will join the joy. It's still joy for the hearers, all the hearers. That is, all who hear the message, all who believe it and trust in it with all their heart, all who express that faith and trust with songs of joy and praise, just as Elizabeth did and Mary. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 10. He says this, For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. You see, just the same. Trust, belief in your heart, and joy on your lips. That's the way to the salvation that Jesus brings. And it's true for all. There is no distinction. He goes on to say this, for the Scripture says everyone who believes in Him will be saved. There is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing the riches on all who call on Him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Did you get that? All. Everyone. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord, will be saved. That's our God's way, because He's the God of grace, the God of gratuitous mercy. He came to Elizabeth, the first hearer, way back then, and she found everlasting joy, joy in the Lord who fulfilled all His promises to her and all His promises for this world. And He comes to us today, just the same way, with the Word, of the good news of Jesus Christ. And faith that leads to joy still comes just the same way, by hearing. So Luke is saying to us, friends, this morning, as we read these words in the gospel that he's written for us, he's saying, be like these first hearers. Believe the promises of God and sing for joy. Verse 45 could read like this for us. Blessed is everyone, then and now, who believe that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken by the Lord. And so Luke is telling us and urging us, join the joy. Join the joy this Christmas. 
and share the joy because it really is a message of joy to the world. Let's pray. Joy to the world. The Lord has come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare him room and heaven and nature sing. Lord, may we, like Mary and Elizabeth and every other who has received the good news of Jesus Christ, may we believe and trust and so be led into a joy Joy which transcends even the deepest and darkness human pain and joy which is everlasting in the presence of our Savior. For we ask it in his name. Amen. Well, let's sing to end this morning of joy to the world because the Lord has come. So now may the joy of our Lord Jesus Christ fill our hearts. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit be with you all now and always. Amen.